Hey everyone, Coach and Hoka Athlete Sage Candy here with another Training Talk Tuesday, or is it Thursday? I believe this is episode number 34. Thanks so much for all your comments and support with this series. We're going to dive right in to the top voted question, and it's a topic I've covered uh, before. Diet and nutrition, low carb, strategic low carb planning for marathon and ultra marathon runners. Um, you know, I'll admit though, disclaimer before we jump into it, my philosophy has changed a bit over the years uh, with my everyday diet being plant-based, but also, you know, looking at the macro percentages, looking at strategic ways that things ebb and flow with things like your carbohydrate intake, going into your running training, uh, your endurance training, and racing different distances, you know, I'll admit, you know, I've been fairly consistent in, in road marathons. I've got half a dozen sub 220 marathons and 100K, you know, up to 100K in ultras, done, you know, some wins there. But 100 miles, 100 mile ultra marathons have totally humbled me. And I've had some disastrous mistakes there in hundreds uh, with nutrition uh, issues for sure. So, you know, I'm not a know it all, I'm not a, a nutritional science major. I did dabble a bit in college. Uh, in biochemistry and stuff and, and nutrition classes. I almost majored in nutrition, but it's a hobby. It's a hobby of mine and uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt, pun intended, and check out my other training talk videos on this topic. Uh, you could see over the years on the playlist, nutrition diet for endurance athletes. Top voted question. Great question. Um, here it is. Is doing fasted slash carb depleted training sessions a good idea? and specifically in preparation for longer races, in my case, my first marathon. If so, how often and how specifically to reap maximum benefits? Uh, does it work only if I have had only water before the run, or can I eat something but less than my normal breakfast to get me out the door in the morning? Which benefits could one expect on race day compared to doing mainly exclusively fueled sessions? Are there any risks to keep in mind? So we're talking about strategically carb depletion, so to speak, everyday diet uh, in the lens of an endurance athlete doing a marathon, uh, the first marathon. So super exciting there. Um, the first point, the first point I want to make is that you don't have to be in a low carb diet, keto diet. Uh, paleo diet or intermittent fasting to be fairly efficient at burning a high rate of fat, body fat, as a fuel source as an endurance athlete. If, if <laughs> you are running fairly high mileage, consistent high mileage, aerobic based mileage, which say over 50 miles a week, 80k a week a lot, and you're doing some long runs up to maybe 20 miles, 32k types of long runs, and you're really pushing the aerobic threshold zone in some of those. Um, that being said, that being said, uh, you don't want to eat a bunch of junk food all the time, which is usually highly processed food, and especially in a, a country like the U.S. here, uh, highly processed foods with a lot of added refined sugars. Uh, generally, they, they just aren't very healthy for you, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to be eating that all the time, you know, pancakes, waffles, maple syrup, cookies, and desserts, really sweet treats uh, for breakfast, and then be stuffing your, your drink with uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi or Pepsi and, and doing a run because you're going to be totally loaded on sugar and your insulin is going to be all over the place. And, you know, it's going to be hard. It may fuel you for a run, though. So some of your runs, some of your runs in training and, and your everyday diet should have some regulation, so to speak, maybe on some of those highly refined sugars, carbohydrates, but not car all carbs are created equal. Um, so, you know, people say, I think a lot of people, especially in the ultra marathon world and, and even the marathon world, they're like, oh, you know, I, I, I do the paleo, I got intermittent fasting, I'm going low carb, I'm in keto, I'm burning fat as a fuel, it's a good thing. It is, it is, and you definitely, if you restrict carbs in your everyday diet, and you're, you know, starving yourself with intermittent fasting, um, and then you go out on a run, over time, especially with easy aerobic paced running, lower heart rate running, your body does kind of adapt. It does adapt, and it becomes slightly more efficient at burning your own body fat as a fuel, and you could be very lean, uh, have a low percentage of body fat, and you still have uh, enough to burn as fuel at fairly low intensities, though. 
at fairly low intensities. And maybe it's a, you know, they could hook you up in a lab with uh, me measuring your respiratory exchange ratio, uh, CO2 basically, and, and oxygen utilization. And they could see what kind of what percentage of, of fat or what energy you're using to, to move your body to run uh, is derived from body fat versus uh, going through your fast rocket fuel, the glycogen stores, and uh, which are mainly in your muscles and liver, but then also tapping into what you're eating maybe during a long distance race. If it's a high carbohydrate gel or a drink mix or probably a combination of both, real food, stuff like that. Um, and they found, yeah, you know, the, the people that are on low, low carb diets get slightly more efficient at burning fat slightly faster at these lower intensities. Doesn't mean you're going to be a faster runner, though. It doesn't mean you're going to run fast at all. It actually, the risks, and this is the end part of the question, one of the risks is sometimes people put themselves in a really low-carbohydrate diet, low-carbohydrate state. It might affect your immune system, but mainly it affects your power. It affects your power at shorter bursts around VO2 max, so like 5K pace running, uh, but also, and this is applicable to ultra marathons, your climbing ability in hilly mountain races, right? You, even if you're power hiking during a 100 miler like UTMB, you still want to be able to have some power as you go up that big 4,000 foot climb in the Swiss Alps. Um, so, you know, it, it affects your power um, and, you know, higher energy efforts, higher heart rate efforts might suffer. So that's a risk as well. Uh, as, as well as your general health. Now, there's a lot of nuance and, and complex things with everyday diet, and I'm not going to say I'm an expert. I know there's a lot of differences with genetics, and people you know, thrive differently. Like, maybe I need to have some more sodium than the average American. Uh, a lot of Americans could probably cut back on sodium in general because they eat a lot of fast food like McDonald's or something like that. Uh, we're, this talk's not about that. But you, people like to cite, you know, some low carb athletes. Uh, Zach Bitter, for example, uh, set some American records at 100 miles on a track, uh, world records. He's gone after, you know, a lot of ultra distance events, generally pretty flat events. He's known for his kind of low carb type of diet. He's adapted it over the years, but even the Zach Bitters of the world, when they're racing those 100 mile world class efforts or they're trying to maximize their potential at ultra marathons, they're still stuffing in some pretty high carbohydrate gels and drink mixes because they have to. They have to. To maximize your potential in an endurance event, uh, you generally still need to be taking in a lot of carbohydrates. If I wanted to go out and run, you know, 50K, 30 miles on nothing but just water, you know, I could. I could, uh, but I'd have to slow down. I'd have to run pretty slow. Whereas if I took five or six Spring Energy Canterbury gels, uh, maybe had some drink mix too, which is carbohydrate, fruit, and yam derived sources uh, to stay hydrated, you know, I, I would be able to run a lot faster. And it's because I'm not going to, I'm not going to bonk as fast, but my threshold for bonking is also lower because I'm supplementing my carbohydrate uh, intake with my burning through my glycogen supplies, but I'm also burning a fairly high percentage of fat as endurance fuel. And that's the whole crux of this talk here is that you do maybe want to do some strategic sessions, long runs mainly, long runs as major workouts in your marathon training. Uh, and this will be another major point where you don't take in as many gels and carbohydrates that you would take if you were doing an all out marathon race. So, you know, I might go out for a 20 mile long run, 32K long run. I might have some fartlek surges in it. I might be doing some up tempo work in the second half, kind of a negative split long run. It's pretty steady effort, steady to hard type of long run effort. And I could do it on maybe two or three gels, maybe only one gel, uh, Spring Energy, Intercoat Sage, Canterbury. It's this plug. Awesome sauce is pretty good too. Uh, and, you know, maybe I'll drink some electrolyte mix as well, make sure I don't get dehydrated. It's not good to not put intentionally make yourself dehydrated uh but you know get get some sodium and potassium in but during the race i might take twice as much uh during a marathon race i might be taking you know three gels an hour and drinking this electrolyte fluid right 400 calories an hour mostly carb uh based carb derived calories it's easier when they're at aid stations and you could just grab the cups and, and chug and and maybe you have some gels in your pockets in a marathon ultra marathon you got a feed station at the aid station, maybe a drop bag, something like that. Uh, so I'm taking a lot more during an actual race.
than I do in a lot of training. Now, if the training session is really hard, it's like a marathon simulator, yeah, maybe you do want to train at full uh, carb intake potential. You, you practice taking three gels an hour, see how that feels. Practice drinking you know, half a liter an hour or, or more uh, if it's going to be hot. It depends on the weather and your sweat rate. But you need to get your stomach trained to tolerate drinking fluid, having it slosh around, taking in all those carbs on a run. But then on other runs, maybe you kind of deprive yourself, so to speak, where you don't uh, take in as many gels. Maybe you're drinking some water, you're doing a long run, and I would only really do it on long run workouts. Long run workouts for marathons and ultra marathons, because I want you want to get to a point, maybe it's after 18 miles, maybe 20 miles, 30K or 32K, where you do kind of feel bonky. You get that low blood sugar feeling, you get that low uh, running on empty type of feeling, and you get maybe kind of dizzy, you lose some power in your muscles and legs. You do want to feel that mentally sometimes in training before you get into a marathon, because if you bonk in the last 10K of a marathon, and there's a good chance you will hit the wall at some point in the last 10K or 5K of a marathon, even if you're running up to your potential, uh, you need to know what that feels like in training beforehand. So yes, uh, does it mean you skip breakfast or really limit your breakfast? Not necessarily, not necessarily. I'm, I'm kind of against the whole skipping meals things. Uh, you know, intermittent fasting is a diet type of trend. There are some benefits. It's evolutionary. It's not always the most healthy choice to do to fuel your training, though. You need to make sure you're getting adequate fuel. When I ran my marathon PR of 216, when I was training just full-time on road marathons, yes, I used to wake up early in the morning and I'd have some plain coffee, no sugar, no cream in it, just some, a little sip of coffee out the door at 7 a.m., Michigan winters, and I could go out and do a 16-mile workout, no fuel, no fuel at all. Um, did that help me run my PR? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but there would be some long runs where I wasn't chugging the Gatorade or electrolyte drink. I wasn't taking in all the gels. Uh, I would just sip water, and sometimes I'd bonk really hard. Um, but you know, during a simulator, harder workouts, interval sessions, tempo runs, you know, we'd practice slamming, you know, half a liter of fluid, electrolyte fluid with calories in it, mostly carb based. We'd be taking in a lot of gels uh, during a marathon type of race. So you kind of want to play the spectrum both ways. And yeah, you could definitely do a few runs where you're kind of carb depleted going into a long run. Uh, you could kind of do some runs where you're going full nutritional strategy. And what I've learned from doing 100-mile ultramarathons in the mountains and not doing very well in them, I will say, um, is that a lot of times people have to switch to real food. You go sweet, sweet, sweet. You're going high carb, high sugars. Eventually, at some point, maybe it's after 6 hours, 9 hours, 12 hours, 20 hours, uh, you're going to have to, you're probably going to want something savory, something salty. Maybe you're going to want some solid food. It's a reason why they have pasta aid stations at races like UTMB and Transvolcania uh, and Cots where people take naps and they eat a pasta dinner basically because you're going two nights. Um, and they also have, you know, potatoes and other savory things, uh, cookies, breads, all sorts of desserts. But you want to switch to real food in those super long ultras because you need fuel. You need fuel. You don't want to just rely on your body's fuel. And the final point on this, the final point is, you know, some of the best uh, marathon runners in the world East Africans, a lot of them eat a fairly high carb diet, Ugali based uh, corn maize type of uh, dish. It's very high carbohydrate based. Yeah, they put a lot of sugar in their tea as well. Um, so it's, you know, if you're eating plant based, by default, a lot of fruit and vegetables, it's generally pretty carb based, but they're not highly refined sugar carbs. Uh, they're more like starches. So, you know, big difference there. Uh, you know, fruit being fructose is a little different, but you're mixing it with fiber, so it, it changes the game. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure I answered all this question. How often should you do this? Uh, you know, like I said, a couple long runs where you, you kind of go low on the carbs. Maybe you go low on breakfast if you're running early in the morning. Maybe you uh, don't eat very much for breakfast because it upsets your stomach and you've been fasting overnight. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to do that more than two or three times, I'd say. If you're consistently running high mileage and you're not eating a bunch of junk food and drinking a bunch of Coke during your long runs, your body will naturally be able to burn uh, its own body fat more efficiently 
uh, because of your endurance running and your endurance training. And you could also kind of get away with other things in your diet, but I'll digress on that. Thanks so much for everyone for commenting on this whole series, Training Talk uh, Tuesdays, or we'll call them Training Talk Thursdays since I always get them out late. But uh, comment below with your top voted question. Again, check out my whole playlist. I've got a whole Training Talk library. I've doing YouTube videos like this for over 12 years here on the YouTube. Thanks so much to all the Patreon supporters, again, for really making this channel possible. Couldn't do it without you guys. Hope you're doing well, and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions.